Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to Radio TV in Pinduka. My name is Sasha uh, Kayinde. Um, we're here once again to have a conversation about um, the Great Lakes region of Africa, particularly uh, Rwandan politics. I have two guests with me today, and we will be going through uh, the recent elections that happened in Rwanda, I believe in mid-July. Uh, I will get my my guests to introduce themselves. Uh, first, we have uh, Mr. Justine Bahunga, um, professor. I forgot the university you no, work in. No, I'm just a simple but, citizen. <laughs> you can introduce yourself. Um, um, yes, I'm, my, I'm a simple citizen now. I'm oh, okay. A, I'm, uh, my name is Justin Bahunga, as you said. I live in London. Uh, I used to be back home. I was a diplomat. Now I'm a refugee in the UK, and yeah, probably that's the most I can say. Thank you. Okay, welcome to me. the panel. Thank and Mr. Freddy me. Usabuwe, I'm so sorry. I, I know I'm supposed to be Rwandan, but I can't say these things. Usabuera. Freddy Usabuwe, welcome to the panel. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for having me. So as you said, my name is Freddy Usabuwe. Um, I'm a Rwandan living in... Uh, uh, Canada, in a city called Terbonne, which is uh, part of the Greater Montreal. I've been uh, back home. I was a journalist uh, and a reporter for uh, the Rwandan Office of Information. And uh, here I did some uh, different works here, especially as a sales and the sales uh, business. And right now uh, I am uh, self-employed. Well, I okay. believe that's what I can say. I'm here just to give some input on what's going on in our country. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate it. The more voices we add to the message, the stronger it becomes. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to bring attention um, to all political prisoners at the moment within the Rwandan uh, regime system, the opposition, and just anyone who is being politically persecuted. We want to always remind you that we are aware of your struggles and we do what we can to stand with you guys. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the world has been celebrating uh, the Paris 2024 Olympic Games um, and that's kind of distracted many people from the surroundings that's happening. And this year, 2024, actually turns out to be a very uh, big year for um, elections. So quite a lot of... Uh, Another competition was going. Some people would uh, describe it as a darker competition um, among certain heads of states in the in the region. Uh, a lot of regimes with little to no democracy. Uh, these leaders tend to cling to power through sham elections, um, and then post those elections, they often uh, do a lot of constitutional manipulations to to um, to make sure that the the, the power is there. In countries such, countries such as uh, Kazakhstan, Eritrea, Cameroon, Congo Brazzaville, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and Syria are some of the examples where leaders use these uh, familiar tactics to remain in control. Um, in our home uh, birth country, in Rwanda, the ruling party, the Rwandan uh, Patriot Front, which I'll just refer to RPF, they've dominated every election since 2003. Uh, consistently, they win with an over, overwhelming percentage like 93% in 2003 and 99.18 in 2024. Uh, the 2015 Constitution Amendment allows the current president to stay in power until 2034. Uh, alongside the controlling political power, the RPF monopolizes key economic sectors, dominates the defense and security forces, and uses the judicial system uh, to suppress both opposition within and outside the country. And so we're now seeing Rwandan leaders celebrate um, his fourth election. Uh, I believe it was yesterday where either they did signing or saw him in with many um, other African delegates visiting. Uh, Radio Television of Change in Pinduka, we invite you, you know, to come and let's really speak um and analyze these victories um and so our to dig in our first um our first analysis is 
what really drives the obsession with uh, scoring such high percentages in elections, particularly in a country with Rwanda, with our with our complicated history, uh, whether it's in regards to tribes or whether it's in regards to one party rule? Um, why do you think these regimes have such a high obsession with the, the number itself? Um, and are the high scores more than just maintaining power? Um, if you don't mind, we'll start with uh, Mr. Justin. You can give us some of your viewpoints regarding those questions, and then we'll go on to Mr. Freddie. Uh, thank you so much for this question, I think, which is really very crucial to understand what is happening now in Rwanda. I happened to be, at the time, when the RPF invaded Rwanda, it was the embassy in Kampala. And so I followed all developments from the time of the attack, negotiation in Arusha, the failure of the of the peace accord, and the take of power by the RPF, and the behavior of the RPF politicians or the elite up to now. My my first impression when RPF attacked Rwanda. I, it was that the other wanted total power and share the power. And much as they say it would resolve the issue of refugees, uh, I would say that if you look at their political program, the return of refugees was not number one on the agenda. It was to come take power and then democratize the system, as they are saying, and improve the economy. So from that viewpoint, uh, when we had we had to have negotiations, which I think was a good thing, obviously it was an opportunity to agree on a compro have a compromise and put in place systems that reassure and protect everyone's rights. Uh, it 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 is did not it did not it is not it did not happen, and of course the other part of it was the part the other part in the conflict that was Rwanda was not militarily able to impose a situation where we would have a fair uh, peace accord. But anyway, if you people felt it was not fair, but it was a possibility of working around it. But again, I think the the group, I, I don't probably want to be to say it is all the RPF leadership wanted and divided the power. But I can think I can safely say that what we see now, that there is a core group which is there now, which has what you want to take power and they keep it forever. And I see the tactics that are used, they are the same as any other dictatorship has behaved. As we shall come to that level, how the Rwanda is controlling, the Arab is controlling the situation. And the score, I think, the, my best. Witnesses, analysts, that would include would include Kagame, and avoid Nizeimana, because President Kagame is on record saying that one is so spineless that they don't know to choose between good and evil. Even saying that Rwandan, if he, he put down in a mud, he might not want to leave the mud for fear of hurting. The mud. So having ninety nine percent of in this situation is not is you know even we can understand it, and of course also Nizema Nevoda said imagine said don't you can tell white but not to me what the result will he put someone standing on his neck or almost going to strangle him and they show him how to put his thumb or her thumb he would do that. So one so the results are not actually uh, surprising 
And probably it's to know how does a population come to be so spineless pine, and not able to choose between good and evil. And then uh, well, that's where we can see why the machine can't, the machinery comes or putting people to such a, a, a level, such a situation where they can't make a choice. And of course, one other witness would be that would be uh, Ka Kabarevi, the formatting. So the format the young, the format the, the formatting of the everyone. So in that case again, but once you, when you are being reformatted, when they ask you the name the name of your mother, you say beans instead of saying the name of your so 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 they 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 show clearly where the Rwandans are and why you could vote ninety nine point eighteen percent. And perhaps I think the preparing was a surprise, it was not it was not hundred percent. That is a machine has to be oiled again to ensure that next time there's hundred percent. So in short, I I'm not the ninety nine percent score is relevant with all dictatorships that we know, and I can say some North Korea they get hundred percent. Saddam Hussein got 100%. I think it was a bit more they had to reduce to make it 100%. Uh, I, I, you know, Syria, I think they had almost 100% before the civil war. So, and but then what I would like to say perhaps how Rwandans come to that level, what are, what are the machine, what the tactics we use to come on that situation? And probably later, if you ask me, I don't know what I can say about, about the, the how the international community responds to it. And the, for the for people outside, of course, you've seen the the absence of many Western countries is an indicator of how we feel about it. The yeah. African, I don't know whether I'll come to that, but, but yeah, we we will come we will come okay. back to that uh, later on because so, it is a really good question because I do find myself wondering. Who is the 99% for, right? Because like you said, Evode, I, I don't know if he's a member of uh, the government he, or whatnot. He's a he senator, famously he's a said, senator now. He's a senator. He's a senator. Yeah. He famously said, uh, you cannot claim somebody whose life is, you know, in danger or who has a boot on their neck fully voted uh, independently and sovereignly. And uh, so then it always, for me personally, comes back to the question, if I am know that my vote is, is a scam, why are you putting 99% to show the the rest of the world that it also has come? I would have thought it actually uh, does not benefit the regimes to show such high percentages, but I'm sure uh, one of you will will speak to that. Freddie, we'll also go to you, uh, you in regards to, to that, that first question. question. Why they should, they, should, they should want 99%? They seem to uh, no, we, we'll come okay. back to that, okay, but I'll then. give, uh, okay. I'll okay. give uh, Freddie uh, a chance some... to, yes. to okay, speak first you. on why he believes the regime cares so much for high percentages and other overall thoughts he had. And then we will also go into talking about, um, is it actually even a true reflection of his popularity? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And uh, actually, I agree 99% uh, uh, with Juste um, Bahunga uh, about what he said. Uh, but I can also remind uh, our, our viewers that... Um, the story of the RPF uh, regarding elections started way far, you know, during the war in 1990, when they started, I believe it was 1992. Um, the RPF, uh, back then, they organized uh, elections in the areas controlled by the RPF back then for uh, some, uh, you know, leaders of the, the, the areas where they were uh, they were it, uh, sorry. Is this during the war, during the civil war? Oh, wow! Yes, yeah. But um, uh, at that time, the RPF, you know, organized elections. But they found out that uh, you know they could not win elections back then. None of their representatives were elected. So what the RPF did after that, they went on killed all the elected people at the time. Okay, so they saw. I believe they saw that uh, elections can't be won by the party, you know, 
I can say probably that time was during the war because RPF was, you know, doing some killings and stuff like that. Probably we can think that because of that, the population didn't believe they were going to do any good for them. Uh, but as uh, Bahunga said, when they arrived on power, they wanted just to, to cling on it without sharing with anybody. We can go back to 2003 when uh, uh, the former prime minister, the late Twajira um, Mungu, went to uh, participate in an in election in 2003. And we know the news came out lately that uh, actually Twajira Mungu won the elections. So Kagame got, I believe, 93% of the vote. You know, but there we can understand that uh, there was a fake vote. You know, they just go and create the votes. They could, and I believe that's even what's happening right now. Because I don't think Rwandans, with all the problems they've been having with, uh, you know, you know, being abused by the power, killed, and, uh, you know, even we can't remove it. How can a population that lives in with hunger uh, where uh the, the where kagame can give orders to destroy the houses of the people without giving any compensation i don't think for example those people i really can bet that any of those vote voted for kagame you know so meaning 99 percent is you know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's just a joke uh, sometimes i look at the rpf and look at the way they do things, and I believe for us, uh, the, 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 the elections and the political system of the RPF can be really, really a case study for uh, in uh, you know in uh, political science in some universities because what's what's happening in Rwanda? Is, is, yes, uh, Bahunga spoke about other dictators like Saddam Hussein, or you talk about Syria and may others. May I add a point? It often yes. comes off as if they're. Uh, Stockholm syndrome. It's like they they're prisoners, but you need these prisoners to create a a, a facade of legitimacy. So it's yes. very interesting. Yes, yeah. And, 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 and yeah, but 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 you know, uh, I remember that uh, when Saddam or uh, Syria, a Syrian president, any other, they were they did not have different parties in the country. It was just a one party system. So which means you know there is no competition. So but. But the case in Rwanda is really ridiculous because uh, Kagame keep bragging it's a democracy. There are different parties, but there are none, you know, because all the, all the parties that they talk about that are in the parliament and stuff like that, they are just in in his pocket, you know. So he goes, you know what? Either you are with us or you are not, and where you are not with us, you get in jail or you get killed. So meaning, uh, this is the problem that's happening there. And I believe myself that Kagame wants to have 99%, not only to show the that uh, he, you know, to fake the law to the, to the international community, but also to keep brainwashing the Rwandans. You know, that's one of, you know, his oppression system. You know, I have 99%, so meaning you guys, you know, you gonna have to come, be at the stadium to party because elected, you know, but you have to get them in the stadium from, you know, for hours before it started. So people are afraid. They're afraid. Nobody can say anything about it. I mean, we speak with people in Rwanda. I mean, I know a few people who told me, you know what? I didn't vote. I didn't even go, you know? So there are so many that don't go, but, uh, you know, they, the numbers are there. And what sh what shows us that it's a, it's a, it's a fake election is that Rwanda, as a poor country, they don't have a, an election system like in the in, in the West. How can they proclaim that Kagama, Kagame won just two, three hours after, you know, the votes ended? You know, how can they? How did they, you know, count the votes? It's impossible. It is impossible. And uh, I believe he does it just to, you know, to keep hang, hanging on power, but um, I believe this might be his last chance to do so, though. And that's what I can say for now. So yeah. it really is like a psychological warfare against yes, Rwandans themselves. Uh, uh, Mr. Bahunga, before I bring you back in, I just wanted to... to I want to add something to... on what you've just said. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want you to also maybe... 
actually you you said something really important the psychological aspect of it yeah i think it is it, we have to understand it and if you have to see how do you get out of it it's better to, to know exactly what we are in for so in terms of i mean the other saying kagam is not alone yes suppose most of the dictators have the same personality traits and psychologists psychologists have actually uh, identified some of, some of them and one of them is they say it is is that actually they they are they preoccupied with fantasies and 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 uh, obsessive about success about power about brilliance and they and and the the worst part of it actually makes them fall they they come to not realizing human limitations and when they start they start to fall and also one other downside of it is that they get detached from reality what of some other says so mm-hmm. 99% when you think about it he said i would why not 100% for yeah. you you are seeing it as actually as i do i would say it doesn't see really that nobody would believe that yeah. yes that's the one where say, but yes. that, that's why i'm saying the psychological part of it and we say most of these uh, of these dictators or they are they are both psycho and uh, psychopaths yeah. and social psychopaths so that's a certain level of it so they are normally arrogant they want to keep power they want to be the best and they never get satisfied to say 70% is okay you would have said let let have more people come in i read the elections they get 30% mm-hmm. i get 70 or 60 but well mr putin mind, mr putin in russia he i believe won his election with 80% and even at 80 a lot of people could not believe that so go on yeah and actually we bring about putin i want to say one day, one day that was the president came said in um, is a public uh, i think he was saying that you know people came advised me if there's a friends whether mm-hmm. if i could like putin or to somebody and come and and do and, and do when when i'm not on top then remember he said this guy is a not democrat that you want to preach in rwanda So if what he was he was saying this is not democracy. Yeah. So that again shows you that at the end of the day you the psycho the psychological aspect of you can it's hard to understand and that's why people misjudge them because you have a different logic mm-hmm. when you are analyzing why can't he behave like that why can't he like and sometimes you make your assessment or for finding the solutions based on your logic not on the logic of the other person i can i can just i can uh, complete you because what's funny is that even his speech you know he did repeat that he said it's 99% is just not a number it's real there are facts and i could see because i i followed the speech and i could see those guests behind him you could read their faces i mean they they, they were like you could see that there's going like what mm. you know it's it's really funny it's uh, you know so so yeah. exact thank you Samuel. so we have have to understand the psychological aspect of it if we want yeah. to have to make sense of what we see and if we're looking for solutions then you have to take to account those psychological traits to be able to yeah. understand and to and, and and to work against that Yeah. yeah. Uh if I can add something it's so we've all kind of at a point where we we've realized and accepted that yeah the electrical score it's not a reflection of popularity but for me more and more it is becoming a reflection it shows the weakness and the lack of confidence that the regime and the party itself now even has on itself. Um when I think you guys are much, much older so it might be even more stark for you when I'm learning about Rwandan um modern history one of the main things that always comes back is sovereignty and this idea of uh multi-party rule the problem with Habyarimana Arimana was he was a single party blah 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 so there's a sense of irony that we're now 30 years later 
and they are now reliving the exact um, the exact issues of voting and sovereignty that they claimed um, was the reason they needed to get rid of Javier Mana. But also the lack of confidence is really stark because for you to believe 99% showcases your regime positively is you've lost touch per se with how the rest of the country, but also the rest of the world and how they really do view uh, the, the, the Rwandan regime. Um, so going forward, we can kind of also touched uh, a little bit on how can we create strong movements for change uh, to emerge in Rwanda? At the moment, any oppositional figures, uh, one that comes to my mind is uh, Victoria Ngabire uh, of the Green, is she of the Green Party or? No, Dalfa, party? Dalfa, Dalfa. Yeah, Dalfa, Dalfa, Dalfa Party. Yeah. And, and she really <laughs> did try to run a campaign. She really does try to create an oppositional party. But you see that the RPF regime it's it is so uh, unconfident, and in a way, they also understand that the population does not stand with them ninety nine percent. And so, what what other avenues can Rwandans use or create in order to challenge this this dictatorship, and particularly within the electrical uh, electrical and world? Yeah, we, uh, we can, can start just... with whoever. Yeah, yeah, I can say something about it. I was saying that if you want to fight a system, you have to know all the tactics it uses and the counter tactics. There's some one of the things you talked about, about about Stockholm syndrome is that I can say three of the when I think I seem to be, and which is common to dictatorships, is violence. It is a corruption. It is coercion. It is a blackmail. It is a propaganda. Now, when it comes to, to violence, what these people do? They are. They, I mean, this is not mine. This is was done by. I think I talked before the pedagogy of the oppressed by a part of. Yeah. I think I said some time back when we were we are together. How you reach. What they call the silence, the silence of the oppressed. That there are three stages, and they will tell me no, it is not applicable to Rwanda. One is violence, an provoked attack, mm. a killing, disappearance, and so you you are actually lost. You don't. You are actually well, they, they call it mm -hmm. you, you oh. use the yeah. control. Yeah. The na, number two is uh, uh, stopping people from expressing their grievances. So even how the the press is is uh, is, is 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 curtailed, is muffled, and they're in prison, others are killed, others disappear, others run into exile. That's number two. In order to gain is shark subis. Yeah. Meaning, actually, a, 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 a card or whatever you call it doesn't complain. You find a solution. So, if you have got a problem, it's not it's your problem. It's not the government. It is you. You are responsible. Yeah. Number three is indoctrination. So, mm -hmm. said you are you are powerless. You can't do anything. And then you come up to a level that actually you admire that person becomes a semi god. You will see that he moves around the country. To show that he is the only one who can solve people's problems, mm -hmm. everybody around him is 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 bad, is incompetent except him. So he goes around the country, and you know the the the, the culture of the Wandans. They like you to see how you're squeezing, how you are blaming the officials. Yeah. So they you create this spirit of of hopelessness, helplessness. So you can't fight. We've it. That is the biggest when you come to what to do, do is how do you overcome that fear. And you spoke about Victor Ngabiri. The very first what he, he she said when somebody in January 2010 is forget your fear, leave your fear. And that's the biggest thing that has to be done to come to a level where People are people. The the critical mass 
knows and the values its freedom yeah. to a level that is ready to make sacrifices, even the ultimate sacrifice of their lives to save this value of freedom. Mm. That the price of your life is what the, the value of freedom is even worth your life. Yeah. And it and so the dictator will never give you your freedom on a plate. There is one mm-hmm. lady, I think Harris, I can't remember the other name, American, he said, it is said of that he said that if I've saved, I've re- liberated, I think a thousand slaves, I would have done more if they knew they were slaves. Knew they were slaves, yes. Harriet yeah. Tubman. That's right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So meaning that actually the solution is fear, is mm-hmm. for overcoming a fear. Number okay. two is valuing the freedom. Okay. Because we, that's, and of course, the, as we said, mm-hmm. they will never give up. What I was saying, there's violence, and we see it every time. Mm-hmm. We see telling is teaching people that is not they have to be about to know the government indoctrination and then that comes to a point you said the Stockholm syndrome where you feel your problem you feel actually your life is there because thanks to the to the dictator to the oppression and you can fight you can fight to death mm. for that dictator yeah. so that so when you see these in Tory school these schools and so on it to come that level and well I actually Wanted to bring in Freddie uh, after you finish your yeah. point because you you're now really speaking about the responsibility of the citizenry, the responsibility of the individuals. But um, something that comes to my mind is the propaganda and how, in a country that people don't have the right of free speech, we then see the power uh, how the regime used the state media and propaganda to to really shape people's uh, perspective perception of their own power like even this idea that Rwandan citizens do have power to make changes like the state propaganda has created an environment where people feel so helpless um so Freddie if you had maybe any comments to add to Mr Justine's uh, yeah yeah I do have a comment uh, I mean I mean I believe myself truly I believe truly that uh, Rwandans will overcome that and uh we are in an era where uh the information because the thing that uh, usually made um, some dictators to, 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 you know, to be so powerful, as you said, as uh, Bahonga said, is the propaganda, the control, you know, uh, of the power, uh, security, and, uh, and so on. But now, in an era where, uh, you know, you can't hide information anymore like it used to be in the past. So, Rwandans, we can see for the last... Actually, for the last five years, we can see some changes because you could see, remember, there are so many that have been uh, killed and others, uh, you know, put in jail because of speaking out, you know, and I don't think it's going to stop. I don't think it's going to stop. The case of uh, Victoria Ngabi speaks to us, you know, she's a lady that's a really very smart lady. She loves her country and she speaks out for everybody. And that's the reason why actually, you can see Kagame now. I mean, he is afraid of letting her or or uh, or Naganda or even Dian, you know, go out there and campaign because he knows if they jump in, he gives them the right to lose the power. Mm-hmm. That's for sure, and the people know that too. But as Bahunga said, you know, the, 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 one of the things the RPF has been using ever since even he started, you know, doing the war is the killing. You know, it's the killing. So people get afraid because he goes, you know what? Uh, if I do this, they're going to kill me. And something else, dividing the people. Mm-hmm. That's very powerful because they divide and they make everybody controlling everybody. So how do they do it? Especially by controlling the economy, you know, that makes people wonder if they can live longer or not because let's say you've got, you you are a rich man there we know people who used to have things in Rwanda but who are now you know powerless they don't even have any money nothing else they don't do it just for nothing the RPF does it so because they're afraid they're afraid that when you have money you can have something to say so people can follow you 
But when you are deprived of, you know, your rights, you know, you're deprived of your economies, what's going to happen next? Every time you need something, you go to the, the, the you know, Kagame goes around, he goes, hey, you know what? Give the give, give the food to the population, stuff like that. I think I think that's one of the things that uh, make the situation in Rwanda very, very, very difficult. But I believe with the era we are in, it's going to change. I, I loved, I liked uh, the way uh, actually Naganda has put it in his, uh, um, I don't know if you guys saw his, uh, his uh, press release the other day. So short and sweet because he said, you know what? What happened? What's happening now? Uh, after you know the elections, we can see that uh, Kagame. This is just his swan song, you know. You know, it's it's it, 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 the even the message, even his speech after after for inaugural speech shows that change, things are changing, and even guests they they speak to mm. the change we're gonna see soon. You know, Kagame is he, is you know his there is there is a start. He's isolated. Of, yeah. So he's isolated internationally, and Rwandans know it. They see it, you know. Mm. Everybody sees it. So I believe time will come where uh, Rwandans going to have to, you know, because there is not who who thought, for example, because people people sometimes forget that uh, the 1959 revolution, okay, mm -hmm. the majority of Rwandans were peasants. They didn't even know how to read. So few people, few leaders, you know, said, you know what, is enough, enough is enough. We can't live longer like this, you know. And those people, they did it. And I believe now, you know, yes, the only problem we have right now, it's been 30 years now. We say, you know, it's taking so long. But you know what, 30 years in a country for the life of a country is not long at all. You know, mm -hmm. we just have to keep having uh, people like... Uh, uh, in Gabide, the leaders like them, people who are on, uh, on the ground, who, you know, uh, who speaks to the rights of the people and uh, uh, bringing change and stuff like that. And I believe at one point, Rwandans will follow. And uh, we can't also forget that all these detectors also, they, they, they stay longer and they keep doing what they do because the, the, the leaders of the world, you know, they, they, they are still, you know, uh, supporting mm -hmm. them. But uh, yeah. what we see now, and don't forget, Kagame says it now. That's what I like about him, though. He tells us when he's a uh, moment of fear, he tells us what's going on. Mm -hmm. So we know that uh, even him, he sees that uh, probably his era is, uh, you know, is going away. Yeah, he he's yeah. under a lot of pressure at the moment from his his main sponsors and backers, because it's I feel even for them. Uh, visually, it's at a point where no, we can no longer, we can't pretend anymore. It's just too stark. But Freddie, I wanted to thank you on how you seamlessly brought us into the long term consequences of these 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 sham uh, victories. Because you're right, uh, each election, uh, as Rwandan citizens kind of learn something something different. They take uh, maybe it's a loss of trust in the electrical system. Maybe it's a loss in the political arena. Uh, but yes, there is always long-term consequences to these. I think a lot of people who are part of the regime uh, downplay it and don't believe, like you said, they do believe, yeah, they're never going to wake up. 30 years is very short. We can keep this going. But change is not, change is very, you never know when change will come or when sure. that one factor but yeah, um, Mr. Justin Pahunga, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of our long yes. co long term consequences? And then we'll jump uh, into the international yeah. community and some comments they had. Yeah, I think one is there is also the element for me that the system has got seeds of self destruction mm -hmm. that we can eat further and further. One. You spoke about the propaganda. The propaganda is becoming less and less credible. Mm -hmm. You know, the card, first of all, was was genocide. Everything was genocide. Everything you said. And again, here you have to be, to know exactly how it works and able to counter it. And it also, you wrote about, I think it was uh, also about, about the divisions also. The divisions they talked about, I think, I have, I want to say a little bit about the divisions and also about propaganda. Divisions, you have seen that how divided 
the Rwandans. If there is anything, for me, who was there in 1990, I think, ethnicity is more pronounced than it was mm -hmm. 1990. Yeah. Because now, what... To be able Could to you come close a little bit closer to the microphone? Your voice was kind of going low, but I think okay. it should be better. So, yeah, what, so the, the the propaganda at the beginning was every Hutu either is active participant or a passive onlooker. So legally, mm. all of them I are corrupt, are guilty. So, wow. so anyone, and then you put laws about the divisionism, uh, negationism, and so on. So this was a powerful tool to make the Hutu calm down. For the Tutsi, the South Asian, as I say accurately, we stopped the genocide. If we don't keep power, I mean, these guys who are as fighting for power, they don't they just won't come back and they finish what they have not done. So that story is no longer as you can see. I can say that five years ago we wouldn't have seen something like written stories. We have some books like uh, like No Don't Disturb. So mm -hmm. so these are the changes taking place. Yeah. In propaganda. And they for for the for the other people they're saying Rwanda started in 1994, before there was nothing. It was ashes, took one from, from the ashes, and then now it is prosperous. <laughs> that propaganda it can't work anymore because I can't go into details, but I we have statistics to say that. And of course, I think in that propaganda, what you are doing now, this work we are doing, is doing a tremendous job to demystify that pro the propaganda machinery of the RPF. Corruption, of course, when we have to corruption, that another element why they corrupt people to give them money for privileges or status. That money is going to be less and less. If they get the money from a if it comes less, it will be difficult to campaign and maintain them. And of course, for them, it is money they are looking after, after, after. They can change. So again, the corruption is also something you cannot maintain for long, for, for a long time. Because the one that in, in now, if you look at the economy, is it's almost, I mean, if the dollar, I think I was about 700, now about 1,500. Yeah. So to maintain that corrupt system where you reward those who are with you, and the panelists are saying, up where those who were before, they were all completely wiped out. And all those who have bought money are those who are related to the system. And again, where they go, how they can get those votes. So again, that one is a problem. Even we were not putting what saying, I think we have to emphasize people can still resist. They can go to yeah. prison, they can be killed. Again, the more the, the other seed of self destruction of a system like this, is more you do it, they might bring resentment. And then finally, as as Osama well said, you never when the spark will come. Yes. Yeah. So, so what? So the, this seed of this corruption, coercion, blackmail. Well, teaching now even we we are here. We know you can. There was attempts here twice. But I, I I can come out and talk, and I and I don't have no problem going on the streets. Getting out this fear is always important. It's a good development. And if we looked at the change that taking place, one take to people. The, if you see how people's eyes, have, images have been tarnished, and also the change is a very, for me, is a very big achievement for that image to change. So, and then of course the other point is is getting involved in wars, unnecessary wars. I think this also going to bring about some resistance, also limited resources. And in the resentments, which you can again not profit the system or kind of weaken the system. So, so that was up. I think when we are, and then the, as, as we were saying, I think the, the the positive is on, is coming, is on. Yeah. But of course, you have to keep on, as we were saying, to say Rwanda is not 
is not going to come from ashes. And, and also, we are coming to that, to how it was hidden, that the RPF was covered in the in this in the in the terrorist act of bringing down a civilian aircraft carrying two serving heads of state. One was given a moratorium because of this of that of that that time it was not that but it will come. Yes yeah. it will come mapping report will come the airman will come. So I I think that the positive is on our side. And I would talk to one other point actually, which is the weakness, is that the or if you look at people who started with the with the president now, they're not there. And you look about it probably. So again, defections will weaken this will, will, is weakening the system. But of course, it's a part of the, the strategy that the system we need we need to move or purge any democratic voices. And the critical voices, and of course that becomes its weakness. Oh. So there are weaknesses in the system, but of course I would tell people if there was a tree without without uh, roots, but there's no wind, it can still stand. So there must be a wind to push it. Mm -hmm. So the work you are doing, and I commend it and I thank you, is important. I I, I asked Danny why 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 was it what is the target of your audience? What do you want? And he brilliantly gave me why this program is brilliant. Yeah. And that's why we change the mind of the people because a war is about perception. It's about perception unless you have, you win it first of all through communication and then the rest becomes, the force becomes a service. But of course you have to create, importantly, we have to create a central force from the extremes, because you we, we can easily fall into, into a problem of using extremist methods of the RPF, because I know the core group for me, the supremacists. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have we have we don't we have to have a different agenda. We have to bring we have the, the, the group in the center should marginalize. The extremes. The yeah. extremes from any side. From the two through the hood, that's the only way we can move forward. Otherwise, we shall go, we shall continue to kill one another. That's that's my that's my and I think we are we have to do that. Mm -hmm. You're and right. Otherwise saying, we have uh, to, yes, I, I can't as people who say when you speak the Arab, we just want to say a group within the we don't say Arab the group within Arab PF is mm -hmm. that 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 ideology of this group in Arab PF. As yeah. you can see in other group. Yeah. Because I no, definitely. Uh, the, the elite... Uh... Can be, globalization can be a big problem. And you can fall into the trap of Kagami or his regime or putting it in the same basket. Mm -hmm. So you have to avoid the same. And that's, yeah. that's a message I think is important if you want to win the war. Again, the dictatorship. Thank you. I'm sorry okay. if I've taken long. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, we will just discuss our final, our final topic, and that will be, uh, bringing it all together and talking about the international community and how they respond to these fraudulent elections. Um, and if there for us in the outset, if there's any actions that we can take, uh, to help encourage global organizations to respond to these fake elections and not, uh, legitimize them. It's reminding me about how recently there's a country in Latin America called Venezuela. They had uh, a bout of elections and the leader, <laughs> the leader that the global elite did not want to win won Maduro by 52 or 55 percent. And there was an uproar uh, within Western media of corruption, dictatorship, et cetera, et cetera. And so during the White House press uh, press releases, uh, there was a journalist who got a chance to actually bring this up. And he said uh, the Biden White House is against Maduro's 55 percent of the election. But what do you have to say about Kagame's winning his election for 99 percent? They asked him the question verbatim. And he said, well, even though he won by 99 percent, he still the election was still open. There was still it still showed a good process. And I was just shocked. I was completely shocked yeah. because here you have the 
the the open uh here you have the truth it's about the interest if a country is serving american interests then they do not care about elections or democracy if it is not serving certain interests then all of a sudden 55 percent is dictatorial and must be stopped um so what what role do you think the international uh community plays and can they add any pressure to make create any differences and we'll start yes. with you freddie and yes, finish yes, off. Uh, yeah. yes actually i believe that uh, the international community um going back to what you just told us i didn't uh, i didn't see that story but uh it's really it's really sometimes strikes me how these international community these countries you know like uh, maduro 52% they don't like him because he doesn't want to serve the American interest. Full, yeah. full, full stop, you know. Kagame is serving those who helped him to get on power because they still need him there. But what we see, what we see, the response, even if they, they tried to be a little bit diplomatically correct with the, mm -hmm. the elections, like that comment that uh, was uh, made that just you told us. But Let's look at really the ceremony in, in, in Kigali. If we look at who was invited, who came, you know, it's striking. Yeah. It's striking because that's nothing like you have been seeing before in Kigali, you know. And that, that ceremony actually serves as a powerful swan song, meaning, you know, it, it reflects on both the end of an era in and in, in uh, of international community uh, you know engagement and uh you know helping kagame and the beginning of a new phase mm -hmm. rwanda's political and diplomatic uh you know that that's what i see because no european country was there you know canada was not there us was not there and we know exactly how these countries have helped the country <laughs> Just one quick question for the audience: yeah. Do do they live in Rwanda? Do they have like consulates in Rwanda? Yes, or would they this do. have had oh, okay? Yes, so they, they didn't they, they didn't even have they to have come consulate. from their own countries. No, they, they were already they there. Did. Oh, okay. they, they did it, and yes. uh, wow. and um, I believe I believe what has been happening, like uh, Bahunga said, you know, a Rwanda story was there was a cap on it. Okay, nobody could say anything on what's happening in Rwanda, especially in regards to abuse of power, you know, killings and stuff like that. But ever since books in, in uh, two or one years ago, the books like uh, the one from uh, Mikhail Rong, Judy River and others, actually also the Rwanda classified, you know, we now see that the West is starting to, to you know, to react mm -hmm. to what's happening. And we know that all those countries are the ones that uh, give money to help Rwanda. You know, I mean, Rwanda is still getting about uh, forty percent of her budget, budget, uh, you know, from uh, ads. Mm -hmm. But as Bahunga said, right now we see what's going on in Rwanda. You know, the dollar, the, the inflation is getting big and big every single day. You know, so we can probably one can think, you know, what what's next now? These countries did not show up to the big ceremony of their friend Kagame. So what's next now? Yeah, there is the war in Congo. So what's next? Are they finally going to put sanctions on the country? I believe that's what's going to happen. And if when that's going to happen, it's going to show us exactly what is the response of the international community. Because... At least they, they they gave out the first message, the fact that they didn't send not even a congratulation message to the president that that speaks, uh, you know, by itself. I believe uh, we will see more come. I believe we'll see more coming. And then that's when you're going to see that uh, probably also Rwanda is going to start, you know, getting more and more and more interested in changing in the change, because if there is no more help, if there is no more uh, money coming in, that means the economy is, you know, the, the people are going to, you know, have big trouble economically mm -hmm. and then they're going to rise. I believe that's what's going to happen. And just even the media cover that the, the international community used to give the Rwandan regime, if you think about it, they no longer have that. So now now I'm starting to see, for example, when they speak about Congo, the 
the limits of a timeline that you're allowed to go back to has been changed. It used to be that you were allowed to go until uh, the first Congo World War. Uh, yeah. in the And then that's where we stopped. That's where everything started. But now more and more, you're seeing people push past that. You're seeing people ask, well, who is Kagame? Where did they come from? Who armed them? So I'm starting to see conversations being created about <laughs> the modern history of Rwanda that tells you that, yes, there is a preparation especially to remove Kagame, particularly his side of the RPF wing outside the picture. But because I really think his image and he's just become so notorious that it is impossible for members of the international community to support him without also dirtying themselves. Uh, but Mr. Justin Bahunga, did you have any other comments to add uh, on yes. the topic of the international community? I think... If anything, there was nothing for the ordinary person. This is a clear a case study of international politics, how they how they perform. If you want anything, you will have finished your history of, of international politics or power politics, interest politics. Mm -hmm. I I quote there is one journalist of Newsweek, he was in 2013, and they talked to a diplomat. Of course, he said he, he wanted to be quoted uh, uh, with anonymity. And he said this. He said, we know he's ruthless, but there is a common a mutual interest. We need a success story. Yes. We wow. need to justify the $1 billion we give out in aid to show that money gave it to Africa is not a waste. So he said there are so many failed states in Africa, and I wish we wish we could have more kagames to fix those countries which have failed. That's in 2013. Now yes. I think the story is changing about that 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 kind of situation because interests have changed. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I went to the con again, the same year, 2013. There is the man called Ambassador Peter Pam, doctor. He, he wrote an article when M23 attacked the Congolese. The title was To Save Congo, Let It Fall Apart. Yes. yes. Look for it. It's notorious. I've seen that one. Yes. And that person, he became the special envoy of Trump for the Great Lakes for 2018, 2020. Yes. My, in that palm is the director of, of African Affairs in the Atlantic Council. That's a think tank for, oh. not, for NATO. Oh so how, what, what I take of that is at a certain point, certainly, they are colluding with probably Paul and his group and the multinationals to have that war and they probably have that part taken over by Rwanda and the northern part by Uganda. But the I think there is, <laughs> there, yes, the response by the Congress, I think, must have shown it can't mm. work. So yeah. the position, I think, of, of Rwanda, its importance, I think, has decreased. Because as you know, the Eastern Congo has got, I think, 80, 60% of the coltan, the, the, so, so in a, I think 80% of the cobalt. And the, the way out of these minerals was Rwanda and Uganda. There was even a report on exploitation and looting of Congo resources 2001, which was saying Rwanda and Uganda were a gateway for the coast guard and there were 85 multinationals most of them based in the in in the states and the 12 in the uk and of course others in africa now so to get the resources this hard pass for one some table i think the development of chigari might have been so it would be have the best gateway i haven't met rwanda recent but when you see it it is the best capital can go with is safe, no beggars, no people running, running, you know, night is, you have got a, a safe, 
So if you can go to Chicago, have everything, you have got Wi-Fi in the buses. It is a good position if you want to, to do business, not part of Af part of Congo to be in Chicago. But now, I think this is very really changing because they've got different interests. And I can say, for instance, you have South Africa got different interests in the Congo. And I was looking at the US. You remember with the last summit in in in, 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 in Washington, the you, Congo, DRC, and the Zambia signed oh, yeah. an agreement with the US to make batteries. Yeah. I think also the US has signed an agreement with the with Congo for I think to to support or to to ensure the safety of the chain of of supply of these vital minerals, yes. or strategic minerals. So what I'm trying to say is, and of course, if you see what is happening now, how the war is going, and probably the, you can steal now, but but actually it might be less, less than it was before. So I think the importance of Rwanda as a gateway through which you get the strategic minerals had, can easily change and they be reduced. And therefore, if we international politics, it might less money to pay for it, to corrupt the to corrupt the uh, the officials. I said to be able to go behind him, and also yeah, why not just go to the source? I feel like that's the challenge for Rwanda now. They're just going and to I the think, source. But yeah. fantastic! That's a, that's another. I think people doubt about the Congolese government. For me, I respect them and I give them credit because. They have, and perhaps it's a good, a good point to, to, to say it again, that people say, why don't they go and attack one and finish everything over? Now, not only that they're fighting to stop it, but also they have got such a legal argument mm -hmm. that you remember the occasion with the Apple. Now they, are, they, yeah. they, are, they have put lawyers yeah. Yeah. to be able to follow up the minutes which are going. And I think that was also, I think, instituted by during Obama's time of of trying the origin of minerals. So I want to be reinforced. And and for and for Congo, and I think I heard it, the president saying it, and I agree with him, Rwanda's power is money. Yeah. To stop the supply of these minerals. Number two is diplomacy. Congo has done extremely well. Sure. Yeah. And of course the third one is the legal and the minerals. And of course you know, about the war, for me Congo has never had a army since for the last 30 years. Mm. And you cannot train an officer to go to lead the war in within only, only two years. No. But the point, the point is that Congo knows, and they had it from the minister of industry, now he's been changed. The solution, whatever they are doing, is the solution is it must be the capacity that anyone Who's, who, who intends to attack or to account, you know, the 48 hours which had been his capital. They are, yeah. they are conscious of that. They are so, but but they are conscious. I know there was, uh, there was, there is a team which started the strategy for the defense strategy, which was given to parliament. So all of these countries, they, they are following up that what is changing and the useful of Rwanda dwindling. And of course, the other one we are saying, you will not go to somebody who's getting 99%. You, yeah. you might talk, talk in, in the backyard, it will, it will probably continue, but that leads to fear to come to the public and say, I'm with you. It is important. It yeah. is important. So when you talk of international community attitude, I'd be surprised that that gentleman who's speaking about a uh, semblance and so on, what you have to do, you and me, you have to call name and shame, as you are saying. Mm. How can you let get to him and people who are around him that he made a mistake? It is it is it is shameful that you could say it was open and transparent when you have only two can two candidates, one gets I think zero fifty two percent, and the, the serious contenders are not allowed. Okay. Put it to him or to her. And that's part of it. And again, it helped, although it is it is something. But at least when, when he has said it and you respond, it will go to many people. Mm -hmm. And this strategy, name and the shame, mm -hmm. 
he might make him think twice or do around him think twice. Yeah, there especially you. especially oh, having oh, uh, oh. just to complete what you said, uh, Justin, uh, yeah. having ninety nine percent thirty years after, you know, you are cleaning on power, and also after all these uh, reports have been coming out every yeah. single day. So he has become a reliability for uh, for uh, for yes. the West. Yes. You know, so, yeah. You know, so, I tell you one small thing. I don't know why I'm an observed it before with Kahendi. Is that, yeah. you know, in the Congo, when Mobutu was about to be removed, what they, I mean, after the second, after the the fall of the collapse of the Congo, of the, of the Berlin War, they never needed him. Yes. Kagame picked, in seven they picked uh, Kabila uh, as a frontman to the, 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 make the war Congolese like they are doing now with the well, I'm Congo. Mm -hmm. And the ambassador, Richardson, went to tell him, he said, you've been a, I've been a friend for so long. Please leave Kinshasa. We cannot, we cannot, we don't want to be, we have been together, we can't see you being dragged in the city of yeah. Kinshasa. Yes. Then he said, then he's, 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 he's said to have said, that's his head of security, was saying it. He said, with the all of us, we have been together. He said, no, it's finished. So the job description, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing it. I'm saying yeah. the job description is we no you no longer fit it. Yes, there's that English saying: "There's no friends in politics, just no. permanent interests, or something like that." No, no. Charlie yeah. said in the politics, there's no permanent enemy, there's no uh, permanent friend. Only the national interest is permanent. Exactly. Yes. Because I feel like now Kagame and his regime and the whole project of what Kagame and Museveni stand for is falling apart. And the way I sometimes think about it, and you can help me to see if it's true, the, uh, you spoke a little bit about the, the new Congolese uh, political group and how they're putting diplomacy and uh, really background talks before war. And I see that a lot of... Uh, political analysts almost mock them for that because they see it as a source of weakness. But I actually think it, it it's, a sh it's a show of power, but it also shows how we're now entering a different um, a different moment within African politics. Whereas Kagame and Museveni really, they represent the almost the warlord. There was like a yes. little period where everything was fighting in warlord. But now we're entering into a diplomatic phase where you will have to sit down and talk and make actual concessions or make plans and so i really that's one of the reasons i really do respect the new congolese government as well they're really kind of showing younger africans they're paving a road for us to follow on how this is how you guys will be able to fight for your own sovereignty and this is how you should fight for your own resources <clears throat> yeah. like you said and yeah, something else. Something. The physical wars, not the physical wars, are not forever. Is what yeah. we've learned. I, yeah, I added to yes. that. Actually, there is. Uh, I, I, and your closing statements, gentlemen, and then we'll we'll finish off. Yeah. yeah. So there is uh, one great strategy, strategist, uh, Sun Chu. Yeah, Sun Chu. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in the art of war. Yes. He said the best general, the best strategy is the one who wins without firing a shot. Yes. Mm. So you make the necessary, you show your enemy that the best interest in his best interest or her best interest not to fight. Number two, the other part he says, you know, the 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 inept, the, the incompetent, he started the war, he tried to justify why he started the war. The new strategist, he knows when to start the war, when to take a pause and how to restart it. And I think many people don't realize, and the people don't know that actually Congo is one the 50 tribes. Rwanda were only two and one small one. You see how we ended. Four and the 50. We have a democratic system of government where you have got people who have left, but you still have a say or an influence in the government fighting you. You have got an army which has not existed for the last 30 years. 
And Eastern Congo, I think the people have to know that also. That there is, and I think they, they agree with it. I know we're talking, I mean, I was talking about the means are called the Paluku, absence of state in the East. That's why we have got 135 group or armed groups because there is a lack of enough police money power, military power, legal power. So the instruments of government are absent. So people fit the vacuum. So you find every chief or whatever has got a mine, a mine, oh. and I'm going to guard that mine. Or some of the big some of the politicians in Kinshasa, their power depends on the on the on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was saying that the what when you explain it, now they are aware that to end the, all of this, they must have the capacity to occupy the space. So that capacity is not there. And if you compare it to it was compared to Rwanda and the Congo said I've got to have a policeman per 156 kilometers. Rwanda has got to one pol one policeman for about 20 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So that that's why we said we have we have taken this town or this town. It's just walking around. North <laughs> Kivu is in is North Kivu is more than, more than twice oh, wow. the, the size of Rwanda. So yes. that's so so people have to realize that Kong is faced with multifaceted problems and it's not very easy. It's not easy at all. It's not easy not at all. And so what um, they have and for me, what what I would demise for me, and that's me, the strategy is right. And number two, they are conscious of the problems. And of course, I think. Kisayedu would like to be the hero of Congo, who have united and invented Congo. And of course, with the uh, with the pressure on, on Rwanda, thanks to the, the promise of the Congo, is is working. That's my, I might be wrong, but that's my that's my humble, honest view. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you and, so uh, much. And, uh, just to, and just Mr. Freddy. Complete, complete and it'll be my last, uh, you know, my conclusion also. Uh, I agree fully with that on what he said. I mean, Congo is not, the situation is not at ease at all because as uh, Bahonga said, 30 years of no, actually there was no military system. Not only the government was not working, you know, it was not working in the whole country. So now to go and start saying, you know what, we're going to fight this war with all the infiltrated infiltration in the army, you know, uh, people that work for Kagame in there, in the government, in the army, and everywhere else, they had to find a way to stop at least the bleeding they did by diplomatic, you know, strategy. And it worked. And we cannot forget that now. Um, Rwanda is in a very big difficult now because the world is changing also. Uh, the Kagame and Museveni were doing whatever they want because the only powers were just the West. Ah, uh, yes. You know, but right now the world is, back, is becoming multipolar. So, which means, you know, there is some balance. You know, so the the Americans, we know, we know their background. You know, wherever they they have interest, they want they they they, they go with guns. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why he, they they had no problem with Kagame or Museveni. But right now, what we see, uh, you know, the strategy for the Congo is working. And I believe uh, Kagame, Kagame, as I said before, Kagame doesn't hide it when it's not working for him. He told us already. So we know now that uh, it's not going to be easy. And I believe the big mistake he made also in his speech, inaugural speech, is bringing out again, uh, you know, that speech of war mongers, you know, because he was a war monger. He spoke about mm -hmm. the war, you know, he's he, 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 again, like, like he was saying, like, you know, analyzing his speech, it's like, okay, the war is not stopping. We're going to fight till Congo does what you want him to do. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean that's that, that. I think that's one of the mistakes he made too. That's why I say I keep saying that uh, you know this is a beginning of a new era for Kigami, uh, and uh, with his friends in the international community, 
and you know uh, and we are hoping that i am only hoping that um rwandans many rwandans in the country understands that too so they can uh, jump in uh, the bus for change <laughs> definitely it does feel like uh, a revolution it, it feels like the beginning of the end of the kagame regime definitely and it also, with everything we just spoke about, it does make me realize why he does need to put 99% on his elections. There's so much background things going on that he does feel at this moment, I need to maintain as much power as possible, uh, even to his detriment, not realizing if you had just put a 60, it would have, 69, yeah. it would have looked much more democratic than 99. It, but exactly. like you say, narcissistic, they're at a quite a it frightening is, it, time. The psychological uh, the personality problem. I mean, the psychological problem is. He, yeah, he's a narcissist. Saying, <laughs> a completely different analysis of how yeah. to look up, how, how they see things. Yeah, definitely. it's a personality issue. We will definitely have to come back on uh, radio TV in Pintuka and speak more about the Congolese, uh, the crisis. I think there's so much to talk about there. I very rarely see it spoken in English. Uh, and yeah, so I encourage both of you guys, my, the panelists, to come back anytime. Uh, you'd like. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, we had a very great conversation about the the Rwandan election that just passed and just some general information on how to keep our head up and keep fighting this fight. So thank you, right. everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Hello? Okay, just a second.